Thanks once more, my brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for bringing us together once again as we conclude the messages this week. I want to believe we had a blessed time when we <clears throat> interface with the presence of God in a very distinct manner. We want to thank the Lord for that. Um, tonight, we are exploring a topic <clears throat> entitled At the Welcome Table. At the Welcome Table, that's the message for tonight. And I want to thank God for each one of you <clears throat> for availing yourself to the blessings of the Lord, for availing yourselves to the uh, table of the Lord, so that we can be able to dine together with the Lord. <clears throat> um, we're going to read from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 7 to 8. And I read in your hearing. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. May the good Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us together as a family once more again. Father, as we recline on this table, we pray that you may feed us. We pray that your word may enlighten and illuminate our minds. We pray that we may hear your voice even more distinctly through the message, the concluding message of tonight. At the end of it all, we all want to be saved. I pray, Father, that you may reach unto all of us for the sake of your name and for the sake of Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, Amen. Amen. Sisters, God has sent me to distribute invitation cards. You are being invited, my brothers and sisters. You are being invited to the great wedding feast in heaven. And I think the song that we just sang resonates with the message of tonight, whosoever will, let him come. And so I am distributing these invitation cards. God is saying there is going to be a great wedding feast in heaven, a great welcome banquet in heaven. And uh, you are all invited, irrespective of who we are, where we're coming from. There is a place reserved for you. If you happen not to make it, your chair will be empty. So please um, resolve in your mind to be there. If you find yourself in hell, know that you are a gate crusher. You are not supposed to be there. You are supposed to be in heaven. Whosoever wills, let him come. And so in the book of Revelation, a message, a solemn message, an exciting message is being broadcasted to the entire world from the book of Revelation. Rejoice and be glad for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made him, herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. 
What a message of hope. What a message of love. What a message of light that dispels the darkness around us. Our brothers and sisters, if you look at what Ellen White says in the book, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 15, she says, I testify to my brethren and sisters that the church of Christ enfeebled and defective as it may be, is the only object on earth upon which he bestows his supreme regard. What a profound statement. Irrespective of the fact that the church may be enfeebled and defective. Oh yes, it may have and it has Laodicean characteristics. And then what is saying, nevertheless, it is the only object, it is the only object upon this planet upon which God himself bestows his supreme regard. What a gracious God, what a patient God, what a loving God that we serve. God has already arranged in advance, even before the bride is ready. Right now the church is militant. It's a church that is in the trenches. Right now, we're talking about the church that is at war and God understands that. He has already arranged a marriage feast for Christ and his bride, that is his church. He's already arranged that uh, marriage. <clears throat> and so, Ellen White is very clear in selected messages, book two, page 390, she says, there is no need to doubt, no need, brethren and sisters, no need to doubt on this one. There's no need to be fearful that the work will not succeed. God is going to carry the noble ship which bears the people of God safely into port. What a message of hope. There's no need to worry. There's no need to be fearful of the future. Ellen White says, yeah, because God himself is in charge. Christ himself is in the cockpit. It doesn't matter, we're going to go through the storms. We're going to go through turbulences. But I want you to know that Jesus, the captain of this ship, is in the cockpit. And it is true, soon and very soon, we will be there. Soon and very soon, this great ship of Zion is going to dock at the correct, the right harbor. This is what Ellen White is saying. And so, brothers and sisters, a banquet has been prepared for you and me. Heaven is ready. The angels are ready. The cherubims, the seraphims are, are ready. The unfallen worlds are ready. They can't wait for us. They are waiting. Christ is waiting with a longing desire for the reflection of his character in his bride. What are we waiting for, my brothers and sisters? Now is the time for us to be clad with the righteousness of Jesus. Now is the time for us to wait our appetite. There is a great feast that is going to take place in heaven. And I want to distribute tonight invitation cards from heaven. Matthew chapter eight, verse 11. These are the words of Jesus. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, and they shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacobus, in the kingdom of heaven. I say unto you, many, not a few, many shall come. Now this profound statement that is coming from the savior himself, <clears throat> is coming in the backdrop 
of a story, the story of the centurion. We are told in the Bible that as Christ entered Capernaum, a centurion whose servant was ill came to him asking for help. And Jesus accepted. He's a humble savior. On his way, he received a word from the centurion. And this was the word. Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just to say a word wherever you are, and my servant will be healed. And so Jesus was amazed. He was astonished. That's what the Bible says. By the faith of this centurion. And he says, never in Israel have I seen such kind of faith. Never in Israel have I seen such kind of faith. That's when Christ proceeded to say, and I say unto you, many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Many shall come. People like this centurion who says, I'm a man of authority. I'm a man of authority. And I've sold just unto me. When I say, you come, they come. When I say, you go, they go. When I say, you do this, they do that. You are the commander of the heavenly armies. In other words, that's what he's saying. Just say a word, command with your mouth and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, not in Israel. This is a rare breed of faith. Do you want God to do something extraordinary in your life? You need to express extraordinary faith. The problem of the Jews is that they, they wanted to domesticate God. They wanted to confine God to, the, to their own you know, territory. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, God is dead. And so he says, I've not seen such kind of faith. And so he says here, many will come. They will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They will come from the east and from the west. Luke chapter 13, verse 29, um, Luke records the same message from Christ. And he says here, many will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south. Matthew records that many will come from the east and west, but Luke says they will come from all direction and they will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. You need to remember that Matthew is writing to the Jews who believe that heathens reside in, resided in the east, <clears throat> that is in the region of Decapolis or Gereza, and the west where they would cross actually the Sea of Galilee and get to this place called Galilee of the heathens, the region of Peria. But Luke is writing to the Gentiles. And so he simply records that many will come. They will stream from everywhere, from the north, from the south, from the east and the west. And so Christ, by this statement, is seeing a great exodus of people from all corners of the world as they come to recline at the welcome table. I wonder if you are one of them. My brothers and sisters, Christ is seeing a great number of people coming. And that's why he says, many will come. The Greek word there is exocene. They will come. And this is an imperative verb. They will come. Like it or not, it doesn't matter how the devil 
you know, is going to rage and cause commotion and confusion on planet Earth because of the sacrificial death of Christ on Calvary. He says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And so he says, many will come. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 to 8. He says, on this mountain, the mountain of the Lord, the Lord God Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine and best of meats and the finest wines. Isaiah is using human language to express the delicacies of heaven. He is using human language. And he says, God is saying, I'm going to throw a banquet for all the people of this planet, those that are going to make it, those that are going to make it. And Jesus says, many of them will come. You and I, my brothers and sisters, <clears throat> may not be amongst the 24 elders, that are already in heaven. We are not there. We are still here on planet Earth. Oh yes, you may fail to be among the 144,000 according to Revelation chapter seven, verse one to five, the 144,000. But please, you can't miss to be in the great multitude that no man can number in Revelation chapter seven, Verse 9 to 10. Amen. Amen. In the great multitude. Just squeeze your way for Jesus' sake. In the great multitude that no man can number. Oh, yes, my brothers and sisters, I pray that I might be able to make it. That's my prayer. And that should be your prayer. And so Jesus continues to say, they shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacobos. That's the Hebrew names. Why Abraham? Why Isaac? And why Jacobos? Why did Christ seven. mention this three? Seven. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob carried the spiritual portfolios which were greater than their names. They carried spiritual portfolios that were greater than their names. Why Abraham? That's the first one. When we look at Abraham, we see this extremely rich man married to a barren wife. Yet God tells him to count the stars and the sands of the seashore. And he says, thus shall your children be like. We see a man who is longing for an heir. He is rich. He's surrounded by riches. And yet he has no heir. He's longing for someone directly from his bosom who will be able to enjoy his wealth with him. Abraham represents the patient endurance of God the Father. He has been waiting for close to 6,000 years for the revelation of the children of God as of the kingdom of God. He has been waiting patiently with a longing desire for the spiritual birth of sons and daughters of God from this barren womb of the church. He has been waiting. Abraham represents the patience of God the Father, the enduring patience of God the Father. Just as Isaac, the child of faith, was born, truly this church shall, <clears throat> uh, this church that appears barren will produce by the grace of God heirs of the kingdom. And I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, don't write this church off. It may appear barren when you look at it. 
When you look at the problems that it is going through, you look at the challenges that are taking place worldwide in every corner of the globe, you might say, oh, who is going to make it to heaven? But may I remind you that just as Isaac was born by a barren woman through the act of God, this very church will produce spiritual children to the glory of God. And that's the portfolio that Abraham carried. Why Isaac? Genesis chapter 22 will tell you that Isaac was presented by his father on the altar as a lamb of sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Indeed, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, Apostle Paul captures the whole scenario. He says, Abraham reasoned as he lifted up his dagger, his knife. He reasoned that God would raise, could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. He received Isaac from the dead by faith. So Isaac is a shadow of Christ who gave his life for the ransom of many. Isaac represents the sacrificial love of Christ. And so Isaac in his life is a shadow, a type of Christ. He carries a spiritual portfolio of God the Son. And why Jacobus? Why should we recline with Jacobus, with Jacob? The Bible does not speak well of Jacob. Jacob, Jacobus means cheat, a deceiver, a supplanter, a hijacker. He cheated his blind father. He cheated his brother twice before running away to a faraway country. What a vagabond. That was his life, Jacob, just like his name. He was good for nothing. Now the conversion of Jacob, Jacobus, and the changing of his name from Jacob, a trickster, a deceiver, a supplanter to Israel, an overcomer, can only be attributed to the power the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a champion, my brothers and sisters, in transforming wretched, hopeless sinners into giants of faith. Just give him a chance in your life. Just give him a chance. He knows how to do it. You remember in the book of Genesis, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void and empty and shapeless. The Holy Spirit brooded over the chaotic environment. He brooded over it. And because the Holy Spirit covered the whole globe of nothingness, of formlessness, of emptiness, the Holy Spirit was there. When God spoke, let there be light, there was light. When God spoke, well, let there be land. The land had to spring up from voidness, from emptiness. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself enabled, he gave credence, power, to the word of God. Give the Holy Spirit a chance. Doesn't matter your life is chaotic. Doesn't matter you are full of emptiness. It doesn't matter you are full of hopelessness. Give the Holy Spirit a chance. He would brood, brood over you. He would brood over you. And something, something exciting will come out of you. Something tremendous will come out of you. Something special will come out of you. How do you transform a Jacob 
into an Israel. How do you do it? The Holy Spirit knows how to do it. And so Jacobus carries a spiritual portfolio bigger, greater than his name. The portfolio of the Holy Spirit, that's transformative power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says here, because of the love and patience of God and the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, heaven will be populated by the Adamic race. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacobus. Glory be to God, my brothers and sisters. We will be there. We will be there. I want you to understand that there is an assurance to our salvation. Jesus has paid it all. He has paid it all. For us to have an appreciation of what it means to be invited to dine with royalty, we need to consider, my brothers and sisters, the story that is in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says here, and David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Brothers and sisters, this is a profound question. It is a profound question. Is there anyone? Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? In Oriental times, once a king ascends to the throne, the first thing that you would do was to destroy all his enemies, especially those who took an active part in opposing his ascendance to power. He would deal with them. You remember the experience of Josiah. That's why, why he was hid in the temple. Because when the king ascended, the new king ascended, he destroyed all the king's sons. He killed all of them. That was a common practice in Oriental times. The house of Saul was a major stumbling block to the ascendance of David into power. David was already anointed as king. But he had to contend with the house of Saul for close to 40 years before assuming his kingship. Over 40 years, fighting against Saul, such a stubborn family. But because of David's closeness with Jonathan, Saul's son, David defied all the kingly cultural practices of the day. He cast away the established royal practices of ascending to the throne. All because of Jonathan's sake, he says, is there somebody of the house of Saul that I should show mercy Verse 3 says the king asked Ziba, Saul's servant, for that matter, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Oh, now, now we are getting it. David is saying, is there somebody left of this house of Saul, this rebellious house of Saul, who has proved to be a stumbling block to my kingship. This rebellious house, is there somebody from this house that I should show the kindness of God? The kindness of God, just underline that one. I want to demonstrate God's kindness. That's what David is saying, not my kindness, 
But God's kindness, I want to put it into practice. I want to display it so that the whole of humanity will be able to understand God's kindness. Oh yes, I want to demonstrate God's kindness to the fallen race of Adam, God's kindness. A race that has teamed up with Lucifer, the enemy of God, to oppose the coronation of Jesus Christ. For so many years, 6,000 years, this cursed race, as it were, this treasonous race, a rebellious rest. A rest that for 6,000 years has consistently worked against the expansion of the kingdom of Christ. And yet, the message is coming to us. Is there somebody amongst the Adamic rest, a rebellious rest, that we can show God's kindness for the sake of Jonathan or for the sake of someone greater than Jonathan. God the Father is saying, I have one of me, my only begotten son, closely related to me, closely, born of my born and the flesh of my flesh on account of that relationship that I have with God the Son. Is there somebody from the Adamic race? Because I understand he is also related to you on account of his humanity. He is also related to me on account of his divinity. With his divine hand, he gets hold of my divine hand. And with his human rent, he can take hold of the Adamic rest, rest. And then humanity and divinity meet in Christ Jesus for his sake. Is there anyone that I can show mercy from this rebellious rest? And Ziba answered in verse 3, the answer to the king. There's still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. He's crippled. He's crippled in both feet. Verse 4. The king continues in his deliberation. <clears throat> Where is he? The king asked Ziba. He is at the house of Micaiah, son of Amiel in Lodiba. Now, this boy, Mephibosheth by name, was the son of Jonathan. And during the war between the house of David and the house of Saul, in the war, in the thick of things, Mephibosheth got crippled when he fell from Micaiah's back during that war. That's how he got crippled. And so, my brothers and sisters, we are all crippled. We are not one is all amongst us. In this great controversy, the war between the anointed king, Christ Jesus himself, according to Psalm chapter two, the anointed of the Lord, and the one who is rebellious, Lucifer, in the process of the law, of the war, all of us are crippled. We are all maimed because of sin. No one is war. The whole world is filled with brokenness. Even right now as I speak, sin has made us spiritual invalids. We are all crippled just like Mephibosheth in verse 4. Ziba says, he is at the house of Micaiah, son of Emil, Amiel, in Lodiba. Lodiba is a Hebrew noun, which means house of bondage, a place of desolation, a place of darkness. What a vivid picture 
of this planet, this planet of sin, is loaded back. That's where he is. Oh, yes. You want him, but he is at Lodiba. He is chained in sin. And more so, Micaiah himself, Micaiah himself is there. He's the one attending him. Micaiah, in this case, represents the devil himself, the chief prince in Lodiba. The, way, the, the planet of desolation and darkness. And so David says, go get him. <laughs> Glory be to God. Go and get him. I don't care that he is in, in darkness, in a desolate place, in Lodiba. Go and get him. Because he's part of royalty. Royal blood is flowing in his veins. Go get him. And I want to say tonight, my brothers and sisters, Jesus, God himself is saying to Christ, you go and get my children. Go and get them. Royal blood is flowing in their veins. They are not supposed to be in Lodiba, a place of darkness. They are not supposed to be drenched in a place of, of despondency. They are not supposed to be there. Oh, yes, my brothers and sisters, you may be hooked up in drugs as I speak, but let me tell you, God has invested in you royalty. He has invested royalty. Don't waste your life on the altar of immorality. God has invested with you royalty. Don't waste your, your life, you know, on the things of this world. God has invested in you royalty, and he wants you home. So I see King David sending a chariot, his own choicest chariot, drawn by white horses, mounted by a high-powered delegation from Jerusalem, from the throne, of this mighty king. And I see this chariot heading towards Lodiba. It is true, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus himself will send his angels to gather his saints from Lodiba. He will send his angels to gather us warm. And so Mephibosheth, I see Mephibosheth being brought to the palace in Jerusalem. How do you explain that? Somebody who is crippled, somebody who lives in darkness, somebody who lives in chains. How do you explain that? And now Mephibosheth appears before the great anointed king in Jerusalem. Verse 6 says, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him homage. David said to Mephibosheth, and he replied, he said to, uh, to, to him, Mephibosheth, and he replied, your servant. That is a mouthful. Your servant. Look at me. Look at me. What do you want from such a person like me? Your servant. Oh, yes. I believe his heart was already pounding. He knew what was going to happen to him. He knew. He knew that the kings, when kings ascend into power, the first thing that they do is to destroy. It is to destroy their enemies, especially those houses that take an active part in opposing his ascendant. And so Mephibosheth is now ready for his fate. And so he says, your servant, I am ready. If you want to cut me, you want to cut my, my, 
my, my, my, my head, I am ready. I'm ready. What he hears next, shock him to the roots. In verse seven, this is what David says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For I will surely show kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. Glory be to God. Mephibosheth bows down. He falls, protest, protest on the ground. He falls on the ground. And he says, what is your servant? What that that you should notice a dead dog such as me? Amazing grace, amazing grace. This is the great exhibition of grace. Amazing grace. How mm -hmm. sweet the sound mm -hmm. that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now. I see my brothers and sisters, we are not staying long in Lodiba. Soon and very soon, Christ is sending a royal chariot of seraphims and cherubims. Soon and very soon, he's going to declare, it is done, it is finished. I want my bride home. I don't care that they are in Lodiba. In darkness, I want them here in the royal palace. I want them, I want them at the welcome table. All this is done to Mephibosheth, my brothers and sisters, because of Jonathan's relationship to David. Because of Christ's relationship to his father, we will recline at the table with royalty. It's not about doing. Mephibosheth did not do anything. It's not about doing. The essence of Christianity is not about me doing. It's about being. Being related to special people. Being related to Jesus. There is no one we so special like Jesus. It's about being, it's not about doing. That's the essence of salvation and that's the gospel of righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith, where Christ imputes and imparts his righteousness in us, his holy life, his sinless life is counted on our behalf. My brothers and sisters, I tell you that heaven has invested everything for our salvation. Yes, in Christ Jesus, divinity meets with humanity. We meet with God in Christ Jesus. Soon and very soon, we will leave this planet of the bondage. We will leave this Lodiba, my brothers and sisters. We are sick and tired of this planet. I don't know about you. Lockdown after lockdown, death after death, sickness after sickness. I don't know about you. Do you still love this world? If you still love this world, there's something terribly wrong with you. I tell you, this is Lodiba, the place of desolation. This is Lodiba, the place of suffering. But the good news of the gospel is that soon and very soon, we will cast away the garment of mourning. We'll cast away the garment of sorrow and grief. Jesus is coming again to take us home. Jesus will send his angels to gather us home. We will all bow down in his presence. My brothers and sisters, we will all bow down and say, worthy, worthy is the lamp that was slain. He will give us access to the welcome table. He will give us, oh yes, my brothers and sisters, access to the presence of God and will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacobus to remind us of the power, the patient endurance of God himself, to remind us of the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, to remind us 
of the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. The question is, will you be there, my brother? Will you be there, my sister? Or are you going to perish in Lodiba? I pray that you may be there. All the questions of the ages will be answered on the welcome table. All the questions, the intergenerational questions, questions of the time will be answered. We will understand it, my brothers and sisters, by and by. Do not seek to understand everything today. We see but just shadows of the realities of heaven. We will understand everything by and by. You are sitting right now by a drying brook in your life. I invite you, my brothers and sisters, at the welcome table to kindly sit close to Elijah. At the welcome table, sit close to Elijah and he will tell you about the sustaining grace of God. That when God allows the brook, the means of sustenance that you have to dry up, he's going to open another door of blessings. The widow of Zarephath who will be waiting for you. Oh, yes. Because at the brook, you were fed by ravens. Now you're going to be fed by a human being. God himself will not run out of ideas in spite of it all. You may have lost your wife. I encourage you as we get to heaven at the welcome table, please sit with Anna. <clears throat> she will tell you that she lost her husband whom she was married to after just seven, eight years of marriage, but then she never quit church. She clung to Jesus Christ. She had the privilege of seeing the savior in his infants. Anna has a story to tell for you. But adventure, you lost your wife. I invite you to sit close to Ezekiel. He will tell you how he did not cast away the prophetic mantle even when he lost his wife. Are you suffering because of your faith? Please sit close to Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And all your, answer, your questions will be answered. Are you struggling with adultery? Please sit close to David. He will share with you that transforming power of God. Have you lost your fortunes because of what is happening? COVID-19, have you lost your fortunes? Have you lost your business because of this unstable economy? I invite you to sit close to Job. He will tell you that clinging to Jesus, the kinsman redeemer will pay at the last day. Oh yes, God restored everything to him. Job has a story to tell. All questions will be answered. Have you been locked down, looked down upon? Have you been looked down upon on account of your race, on account of this color of your skin? Please, I invite you to sit close to Zipporah, the wife of Moses, who was persecuted by Aaron and Miriam on account of the fact that she was a Cushite, she was black. She will tell you our God is an all embracing God. He embraces everyone. Have you spent years as couples without a child? I beg you to sit close to Abraham and, I, and Sarah. You will hear how faithful God is. How faithful this God can be even in the midst of infertility. Have you been falsely accused and cast into prison? Sit with Paul and Cyrus. They will tell you that God has always uh, 
a bigger picture of every experience. Oh yes, there is a jailer there in prison and he needs to be served together with his family. <clears throat> Have you experienced loneliness and isolation far away from your home? I beg you to sit with Joseph, the diasporian. He will tell you how the Lord was in, with him all the way away from home. And the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Even in the pit, the Lord was with Joseph. Even on the auction floor, the Lord was with Joseph. Even in prison, the Lord was with Joseph. In palace, the Lord was with Joseph. Are you struggling with rejection? Sit with Mary Magdalene. She will tell you of an all loving savior, Jesus Christ. Do you feel you have betrayed Jesus? I beg you to sit with Peter at the welcome table. He will tell you about how God forgives and restores relationship. Do you think you have sacrificed so much for the kingdom of God? You have given so much tithes and offerings, donations. You have given so much. Please sit close to Jesus. He will show you his cards. All the answers will be there. All questions will be answered. All generational and intergenerational questions will be answered at the welcome table. The question is, who will sit close to you? Do you have a story to tell? Do you have the story to tell, my brother, my sister? Do you have a story to tell in heaven? It is my prayer that by his grace, you will make it and I will make it. What a banquet, my brothers and sisters. Don't miss that one. Never miss that one. All of us will sit in the VIPs. Oh, yes. We will sit at the high table. High table. We will sit with royalty in heaven. My brother and sister, make an appointment. Make an appointment to be in heaven. All heaven is waiting. Jesus is waiting. He's beckoning on us. He's waiting for his bride. He's waiting for you and me. I pray that this may be your experience. I pray that we may might meet one of these days. Oh yes, at the welcome table. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.